Welcome to Carolina Sculpture Studio. My name is Clint Button. I'm a granite sculptor. And welcome to video number 85 of the Virtual Stone Carving Apprenticeship. Um, just going to pick right up uh, this video polishing this this stone. Um, it's uh, um, it's it's a I'm working. It's just a busy process. And so um, the video ran long on the last one. Caught enough content that I'm just going to go ahead and split it into two videos. And uh, but uh, uh, we'll dive right in without any introduction. You know we're we're working. It should be pretty self-explanatory. If you watch the last video. You know exactly what's going on. If you didn't watch the last video, go watch it and then come back and pay attention to this one. So uh, let's dive right in and see how this polishing goes. Okay, I've got this pretty much where I can get it. I think it's good. Uh, like at some point, you just got to decide and stop, make an executive decision, say that's as good as I can get it, and quit and move on to the next step. Um, that's why it's important to do each step good, but it's pretty smooth. Uh, there's not any cloud when I squeeze it off and let it set, uh, and I got a nice good, nice good surface. Um, using tin oxide, just powdered tin oxide on the stone with a hard felt bob, you know, or you like I said with Gary at, at Celestial, all we used was he had a die grinder with a little. Uh, holder with a screw in it and you just would put a knot of a t-shirt in there that old white t-shirt he tore up and that's all he used we take a brick piece of busted grindstone that was wore out and brick everything down until it was smooth and then polish the detail and that's not suitable for doing a big surface like this but it'll work for your small carvings and your small polishing work especially for irregular surfaces but uh you can make your slurry and dip it in there put some on the stone um, you don't want this to be irrigated like you do when you're grinding because it'll sling everything off. This makes a mess. This will fling this stuff everywhere. So get it wet and then work with it and keep it wet enough that you can move. Not that it sticks and dries and burns up, but that's it. <laughs> Let's see how this looks. I had this is no camera trick. So let's see if this is nice and shiny. Yeah, there's a good difference on the end here where we've done it. So we we'll just keep going. And this takes a while. This doesn't cut very much. This is pretty slow. So get into a good comfortable place, good rhythm, but I got a nice flat surface and that's the whole goal. We want this to be just as flat as possible. I've got one little dig that'll be right on the edge of the die because the die's gonna be come out to about this long. Should be. Should be right on the money because that stone we're going to be four six and it's five foot, so we're going to be pretty wide. Um, but uh, other than that, pretty fantastic, pretty happy. But yeah, we'll have we'll have tin oxide all over everything in the world. Then I got to clean everything up so I don't look like I'm a mess here.
once you reach a certain point, like I said, executive decisions, as you polish this, you're going to see the color change. It's going to, it's going to get a deeper quality, a uh, different value. Uh, we talked about value before. And when you get to that point, at some point, you're going to have to stop. And unless you polish all the time, which I don't, you're going to have to stop and let it dry so you can read it. Because what will happen is you'll keep working on it. You go, well, it ain't changing. Nothing's happening. It's, it's not it's taking forever to dry off. And, well, that's because it's polished. And it doesn't, it's going to stay that color. So we got to see how it looks when it's dry. So we'll squeegee it off really good. I'm going to go up, put this video on the computer, start editing it. Wish I didn't have one little pick right there, but that's the way it is. And uh, We'll uh, see how it looks in, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour after it's that time to dry. I'll put the lamp on it, let it let it heat up a little bit and dry off. We'll see how it looks. I think it'll be pretty good. All right. It's the next morning. Stone's completely dry. Um, I'm going to try to feed in a little bit from uh, yesterday morning before I started, before this was polished. But uh, you can clearly see it's a shiny stone. Now, if you look, let's see if I can, I don't know if I can really catch this. Um, I still got a little bit of cloudy over in here. There's a few spots where it's not quite even. Um, I'm gonna spend some time, probably just with the tin oxide, and go back over it and uh, spend a, while longer trying to get some good pressure on this try to get that polish tightened up especially around the edges because the reality is is the only thing that's going to show is a small margin around the edge here we're going to cut this back a little bit um, as soon as this is polished but if this polish is dull along the edge that's where it's got to show we got to fix that but where I spent more time working on this side of the stone and leaning across than standing on this side of the stone and working in, I haven't been able to put as much pressure on this. You really have to work this. This is a physical, physical job. I mean, when you, I, I talk about carving and, and uh, how you don't need to squeeze the tools, you don't need to fight the chisels or squeeze the hand machine, um, and you pretty much have to let the tools do the work. When you're polishing, you have to really make sure that that polisher is engaged in the job and you have to physically push and fight and make it happen uh, in order to close it up and get a really good polish. Now, you're never gonna get the kind of polish that you get off a polishing bed that's got a lot of mechanical weight and pressure where they just have a gantry type set up, a bridge, and that bridge has polishing heads and goes and it grinds it down and levels it and then you change heads and everything and the abrasives, uh, it, can, it can impart steady pressure because you physically can't keep, I don't know, 100 PS, however, however big you are, how hard you can push, you can't keep that pressure on the stone nonstop. And so you're going to have spots where it does have some shadow to it, a little or cloudiness to it that you need to get rid of. So we'll have to work this. I'll spend a bunch more time today trying to get this closed up and make it look good. And if I'm not making progress with the tin oxide, that means the stone's still too rough and I'll have to back up and use the diamond a little bit. I don't want to, but we'll see. So start getting sloppy again. One other thing that I didn't show yesterday, didn't mention it, you can also put your tin oxide on the stone get it wet and then almost like you're waxing a car to get it spread out to get started. Um, there's lots of different, I don't know one way is not better than the other. Some people do this and then polish it till it's gone. 
Um, it, but you just have to keep it lubricated enough that you don't get hot. And uh, get your water just right. So hopefully you keep more of it on the stone than all over your studio. <laughs> Okay, this should be obvious, um, but usually it's obvious after somebody tells you. When you're working this tool, okay, it's turning like this, okay? If I put it here when I'm working an edge, so it's rotating towards the edge, it's gonna tend to dig and grab and dish and chip the edge and it'll chunk this and it'll fly off and it's a train wreck. If I spend my time like this and approach the edge this way because it's spinning like this I've got support here I can keep my pressure here and not have it leaned on the edge and I can help avoid rounding the edge and also from tipping it and that's just a typical grinding it's common sense and uh, but until you learn it it may not be common sense so just think about that but while I'm working this edge I'm not going into it like this I'm coming I'm going like this so the tool can see like I'm going like this so the tool can spin towards the edge. Gives me a better I think this is executive decision time. So I'm going to wash it because there's going to be some debris on it, just some dish soap. But I don't know that I'm going to improve it tremendously beyond this point. And you, you got to make a decision at some point whether you're going to keep going or whether you're going to stop. Because what happens is if you just keep scrubbing on it, you're going to end up dishing it and it's going to start to get wavy and it's still really flat even the one scuff is still pretty flat the way it measures if i'm four six it's going to be and i'm planning to be wider than four six probably four eight to four ten that's not even going to be out in the open so um just put a little bit of water on here um it's important to mention i've got this set on blocks on wooden blocks this water will wick down around the stone and saturate the blocks and stain your stone, um, especially if they're pressure treated like mine to help mitigate any bug issues or termite issues or anything like that. Um, so it's important to, I've got these on fire pads and we'll uh, make sure that nothing stains the stone. On the joint's not a big deal. On something like this die laying down where it's laying down on the back, if you get a big stain in that stone, you got trouble. So when I turn that stone over, it'll be on pads. And before I do anything like washing it, I'll have to make sure that I've got plastic on top of any, anything that the stone's sitting on so that nothing can wick into the stone. Um, because anything that's in the stone, in the wood, will make a mess. We're going to wash this up. We're getting pretty close. And then we got to let it dry, see how it looks. And what I'm going for is to have enough differential in the color. That it's really obvious that it's polished because I want that brightness to help light the stone a little bit. You also have to be careful about getting the stone wet like this. 
you're not going to clean it soon, um, I'll probably take an acid wash this as soon as we're done because anything where I got a tool and he rubbed a tool on any like the rock pitch, you know, like this, it's going to rust, it'll stain the stone. We want that to definitely not happen after all this work. We don't want any, anything like that. So, and we're going to be more critical looking at the polish here in the studio and you're going to see out in the harsh sunlight because the harsh sunlight is going to make the polish it'll usually compensate to a certain extent when we get stone in the studio that's been polished especially if you wash it or you get it in a really good rake and light you'll see every little imperfection in that stone that in the in a production scenario you'll never notice but where we're hyper scrutinizing the stone, we'll see things that aren't obvious to other people. And so you've got to realize that you can only reach a certain point and then you're going to reach the limit of how that stone polishes. Remember I told you about how a stone closes up or doesn't close up? It may never close up any more than what you're seeing. And so you'll find out that if you focus on an area and it stays cloudy, there's a reason. If you're putting even pressure on two areas and one area closes up great and the other area doesn't, you're probably looking at an issue with the stone as opposed to an issue with your technique. So, but we'll let that dry off and double check, but I think that's done. I gotta clean up this splatter and mess around here so I don't look like a clown. And uh, we'll uh, let this dry off. Should be really nice looks pretty good for something someone like me can do so because that cloudiness that was there before is nowhere near the prominence that it was it's way more balanced out with other areas that look the same there's no differential and that means that it's the way the stone's going to look so because Georgia blue is is a little softer than berry gray it won't close up quite as well in terms of polish. Yeah. <coughs> That's going to be a pretty stone. <laughs> when you start cleaning up, I don't polish very often so I've put my tools away. So you need to open this up, get it out where it can dry out, open it up. You need to open all your valves and clean it really well and let the hoses drain so they drain completely because if you have anything left in there you know it's easy to let them hang down and let the water accumulate and then you can move the hose later but if you have anything left in there it tends to cause problems and if you put it away and not use it for much you may take it apart and find out that that turbine doesn't work and they don't work, so you have to take it apart and clean it. I did that once when I first got it. Um, but uh, just uh, put them up and dry them up really good. But we're getting things all picked up and wrapped up. I think we're pretty well wrapped up. All right, we're all finished up here. This is polished, it's hand polished. It looks like it's hand polished. Um, it's, it's pretty good. Um, you know, you'll, you'll always be able to look at a piece of hand polished stone generally and tell because it's not going to have the same characteristics as a machine polished, especially a flat stone because you're not going to have it perfectly, perfectly flat. You're going to see some movement in it generally and the longer it is, the more movement you'll see. You'll also find out like right through the middle here, there's a light streak. That's part of the stone. You know, um, so you, you've got to realize that natural stone is going to have variation. This closed up really well. You know, it's Georgia Blue. That's what Georgia Blue does. Georgia Blue and Barry Gray, my favorite stones to carve because they close up so well. So, um, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about what I, what I used and what I didn't use. Now, you don't have to have a fancy alpha polisher for doing detail stuff you can use an electric polisher you can just have a water hose just dribbling out of your garden hose on the stone it's not complicated but I mentioned Gary just used an eye grinder 
Um, and you can buy different mandrels to go in your die grinder. This will use a lot less air if you've got a small compressor and you're not polishing a huge flat surface. One of the die grinders uses a lot less air. That Alpha, I think, uses 15 CFM. And I think my compressor is 17 or 18 CFM. And uh, it was ready for me to quit yesterday. It was sick of work and it was a it was getting hot. It got a lot of use and got, got you know, more use today. Um, but with a small die grinder, you can get a, you can get tools that have the actual felt bobs on them. You can buy them, you know, buy them by a bag for them. Um, you can buy a mandrel that has a screw thread where you can put a felt bob or sand pads or rolls or whatever on there. Or you can buy something, this is for a cutoff wheel. And Gary used something like this, and it just has a screw through it. And, you know, you, you can use a longer screw if you need to. You know, it's not that complicated. But you just take the screw, and he'd take, you know, like for a little cutoff disc like this, he would just take this mandrel, and he'd put a wad of fabric in here off of an old jersey t-shirt and tighten that screw up in there. And you, you got to use, like, cotton. You can't use a synthetic because synthetic will tend to burn and scorch if you get it hot. And, uh, and if it's not a knit, it tends to fray really fast. But he just wad a real tight piece of cotton T-shirt in there and tighten that, tighten that screw up really good. And he'd polish all the detail with it after it's ground down. And you can put, you know, you can work it in with emery paper, different pads or whatever, but you can polish stuff like that that isn't a large flat expanse really easily. While I was, I had something come up while I was doing it and I hadn't mentioned it and I want to. Um, the, the pads, the, the uh, masonry uh, cutoff discs that I mentioned using are 46 and 60 grit, not 80 grit. And so I had something come up and I went looking to see what I had left. Whenever you buy these pads, um, you'll typically buy them in a set. You buy a stack of them, There's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. And they go 50, 100, 200, 400, 800. They, they double every, every grit. Buy a whole stack of them. And when you buy them, buy two or three stacks. Because if you polish much, what will happen is in the middle of a job, something will come up and something will happen. Um, this is what happened. Um, I've got one of these, I've got an electric grinder that I got as a, it's a variable speed polisher and it came with a bunch of these pads uh, and they were dirty. They used them like in a, um, you know, they had grease automotive stuff on them so I can't use them around stone. So I use them to set up aluminum that I'm polishing like on some of my old motorcycle projects. Um, the problem with these pads, these diamond pads with the, with the hook back on them, um, if you use them either dry without water, like I mentioned you can do, or you use them, you know, for something like polishing metal, like which they, I don't know whether they're designed to do that or not. I don't know. They work pretty good for setting it up. The, the adhesive doesn't like heat. And so as these things heat up, once they start to tear, they just fail. And you'll feel it. There'll be a flutter, a different feel, different vibration in your tool, especially when you pick it up off the stone, you get a, a different pulse. So once they start to, I haven't found any glue that works to fix this. So this is a hand polish and this is for hand rubbing at this point. I'll put it in the drawer and do something with it. But um, while I went looking, I found that I had some 50 grit. So I used this 50 grit, I got a new 100. That's why I said, Buy a stack of them. Don't just buy one stack. Buy two or three so you've got ones to save your butt if you are in the middle of the job and it flies apart. And now you got to figure out either you got to spend twice as much wearing out the next one to get caught up. You know, um, it's just a smart thing to do to have some backup unless you can just literally go down the street a quarter mile and buy them anytime you want. And most people, even I'm not in a position where these materials are just available like that. Um, but the 50 grit works well. I never use it because I've got 46 and 60 in those big masonry wheels. 
So if I need something like that, I just use one of those. So I had some 50s, but because this is a big flat, worked great, was able to polish this all up. And yeah, the longer this dries, the more I'm seeing a little white streak right there. Um, and that's natural in the stone. It's got nothing to do with the polish. So um, you'll have things like that. But uh, we'll come back in the next video. I got to push these edges back, go around a quarter inch on a couple of them. Um, we'll use the full pattern and cut it back and mark it. And, and then um, put some straight lines because we've got to have a nice straight line. This is, you know, obviously this is the front. And so we got a straight line after we cut it, we'll tip the edge and brick it and so it doesn't break. And we've got to do the mitered corners and make those look good. So there'll be a lot to cover on the coming videos. But um, this is how you polish granite. It isn't rocket science. You just got to do it. And you got to be careful. Go slow. Um, and you got to make a decision as to when to quit. If you keep working it, the more you work it, the harder it is to keep it in a flat plane. And you'll get more undulation. You'll get more ripple to it because it's really hard to just go exactly the same amount everywhere with exactly the same pressure when you're doing it all by hand. Get it to a certain point get as good enough get as good as you can do it and then realize you got to quit combing your hair sometime it's only going to look the way it looks you just got to quit so um pretty happy with it but um we'll wrap this up my name is clint button i'm a grant sculptor here at carolina sculpture studio with a virtual stone carving apprenticeship thanks for coming in